Welcome to mini lecture one on Nancy Fraser's concept of social injustice. This lecture introduces you to the work of Nancy Fraser, an important theorist on social justice, and to some of the debates to which her work has given rise. Nancy Fraser is a US-based critical theorist, political philosopher, and feminist. Her writing spans over three decades from 1989 to the present. Firstly, Fraser's conceptualization of social justice comprises a multi-level, multi-dimensional model that provides both a normative framework and a tool for critical analysis of contemporary societies. We believe that these are tremendously useful for human service practitioners, and I will use this lecture to explain this aspect of her work. Secondly, debates around Fraser's ideas on social justice point to important gaps particularly around how human service practitioners should respond to prevailing social injustices. These need to be considered as well. So in this lecture, we will look into some of the debates on her work and what they imply for this course on equity and diversity. Fraser's theorizing on social justice builds on her understanding that participatory parity, that is equal participation in public life, constitutes the central norm against which to evaluate how just or how unjust particular social arrangements are. In her own words, she contends that social arrangements are just if and only if they institutionalize the possibility for people to participate on a par with one another in all aspects of social life. This means that social arrangements are unjust if they entrench obstacles that prevent people from the possibility of parity of participation. In other words, the extent to which ordinary people are able to speak and be heard by others, and that includes their views on the human services they receive and provide, is as central to attaining social justice as it is to assessing how just a given society is. Obstacles to social justice are constituted, for example, by economic inequities and patterns of social positions and by power relations which privilege some groups of people while excluding, marginalizing and disadvantaging others. Much of this module is spent looking into what kinds of privilege exist and what kinds of groups are experiencing social injustice in Australian society and how the two are linked. So, inequalities of participation in social life are at once the source and the result of substantive injustices, just as the presence of equal participation both ensures and indicates the absence of such substantive injustices. In other words, we find at the center of Fraser's arguments the notion of circularity between the causes and effects of social injustice. Let us now look more carefully into what is meant by the term substantive injustices and circularity between causes and effects. According to Nancy Fraser, social injustices can occur and social justice may be advanced on three different levels of social life. On the first level, you find first order injustices concerning substantive issues or what Fraser calls the what of social justice. On the second level, you find second-order injustices that concern the frame that is the who of social justice. On the second level, we are concerned, for example, of who is con with who is considered to be a member of a group or society and as such is seen to be able to make legitimate claims to be treated fairly. Third-order injustices concern process that is the how of social justice. Here we ask, how decisions concerning social justice are made. In addition, Fraser contends that social injustices occur in three dimensions. Social justice can and must be advanced in all three of these dimensions. The first dimension is the economic dimension. It is here that, for example, issues of unemployment and poverty are located. The second dimension is what Fraser calls the cultural and legal dimension of social justice. Examples of this would be the issue of gender equality and the extent to which women's voices are taken seriously in public debates, 
or the awareness that public institutions should be completely accessible to people with differential abilities. The third dimension is the political dimension. A good example of this would be debates concerning the extent to which first Australians require and are deserving of affirmative action in the workplace or debates concerning special political institutions to strengthen their input into public policy. Let us now look at the different aspects of this model, first by considering the relationship between the different levels and dimensions, and then by considering each level and dimensions in more detail. An easy way to imagine the relationship between Fraser's different levels and dimensions of social injustice is to picture them as a magic cube, once a popular toy that is depicted on your slides. If you regard the magic cube's rows as representing Fraser's three levels or orders of social justice, and the cube's columns as representing the three dimensions of social justice, you can easily see that these are interlinked in dynamic ways but in irresolvable ways, and that changes on any of the levels and in any of the dimensions inevitably lead to changes on all other levels and dimensions. This image pertains both to opportunities to advance social justice and to dangers of growing injustices within Australian society. As we just said, on the first level, Fraser's framework engages with first-order substantive issues, or what she calls claims concerning the what of social justice, and with the three interrelated dimensions within which social injustices may occur, or with respect to which social justice may be advanced. Within the economic dimension, <coughs> social justice concerns the distribution or the maldistribution of rights, opportunities, and resources along a society's particular class structure. Besides the issues of poverty and unemployment just mentioned, we could also consider education. So while every Australian child has an equal right to education, we might find that public and private schools have access to very different levels of resourcing, thereby advantaging children of wealthy parents who can afford private schooling, while disadvantaging children of poorer parents who rely on public schools. And while all Australians with the requisite marks may have a right to attend university, we might find that those living in remote rural areas have less opportunity than urban residents to do so. Issues of recognition and of misrecognition unfold in the form of internal status hierarchies, especially along lines of race and gender, but not limited to those and these are located within the cultural and legal dimension of social justice. These hierarchies serve to place members of specific groups in disadvantaged positions, thereby enabling or disenabling their access to principally existing rights, opportunities and resources. So, whether women are formally recognized as equals, and whether they also enjoy equal respect in the micro-situations of their daily lives, are both matters of recognition. And an institution that proclaims to be affording equal access to people with differential abilities might still fail to recognize some of the intricate challenges faced by people experiencing a wide range of abilities. Finally, the ordinary political dimension of social justice concerns questions of representation and of misrepresentation. Here we are concerned about things such as the impact of alternative electoral systems, affirmative action rules in terms of engagement in public discourse, and decision-taking on people's access to rights, opportunities, and resources. So to stay with our earlier example, whether the wide range of disadvantages faced by first Australians translates into appropriate legislation and practices to address them depends on the kind of voice afforded to members of these groups in Australia's political debates, whether that be in Parliament, in the newspapers, on social media, and so on, and on their ability to actually impact budgetary and policy decisions at all levels of government. By introducing into her model a second level of justice, together with the notion of framing, Fraser moves beyond her prior arguments, 
She suggests that as the impact of globalization, for example, in terms of economic globalization or global migratory movements, is increasingly and disturbingly felt, the appropriateness of the nation state as the primary context within which to conceptualize and effect social justice needs to also be critiqued. Constituting the grammar of social justice, framing issues are issues of scope and pertain to the question of who does and who does not count as subjects of justice. Located within the political dimension, framing operates through admission criteria, procedures and the denial of membership, for example to non-citizens in their country of residence. Another example in the Australian context would be the question of whether asylum seekers arriving by boat would be allowed entry and the right to pursue their claims while living on shore among Australian communities. In her own words, Fraser puts it like this. Far from being of marginal significance, frame setting is among the most consequential of political decisions. Constituting both members and non-members in a single stroke, this decision effectively excludes the latter, that is the non-members, from the universe of those entitled to consideration within the community in matters of distribution, recognition and ordinary political justice. Those are our three dimensions. The results can be a serious injustice. The injustice remains as long as the effects of political divisions is to put some relevant aspects of justice beyond the reach of those who have been excluded. Situated on yet another level that is operating as third order justice or injustices are issues of process which pertain to the how of social justice. These two concern the question of what makes for a fair and equitable grammar of social justice. Like framing, process issues are located within the political dimension of the model. It is here that Fraser introduces the notion of transformative politics and the notion of counter public spheres, by which she means that those wishing to resist dominant forms of social injustice may need to begin by demanding political voice. The suggestion is consistent with the centrality of the norm of participatory parity in Fraser's understanding of justice. The issue of political voice, however, is a complex one in practice, and we will look at this in more detail in the remainder of this lecture. So who should be the ones to resist social injustice? Should those who are excluded, marginalized and disadvantaged speak for themselves? If so, what if they do not have a loud enough voice, that is, the majority of society is not keen to hear, listen to, or respond to their concerns? Should they then also be spoken for, and if so, by whom and how? What should be the terms of engagement? We will explore these kinds of questions throughout the course on equity and diversity. For now, let us simply consider Thompson, who quotes Fraser to say that the questions are again linked to the three dimensions of first order injustices. He notes that those who lack political voice are unable to articulate and defend their interests with respect to distribution and recognition, which in turn exacerbates their misrepresentation. The same analysis can be extended to excluded outsiders. The result, Thompson says with Fraser, is a vicious cycle in which the three dimensions and levels of injustice reinforce one another. Fraser argues that in order to turn vicious cycles of injustice into virtuous cycles of justice, people who already enjoy a voice will need to engage in critical reflection and dialogue. She says that such reflexivity might lead to greater inclusivity, parity, and eventually translate into more just distribution and recognition as well. This is one of the topics in Module 2. For now, we simply need to note that many privileged members of society do not have the awareness, nor the ability or the will to critically engage with the exclusion and voicelessness of others. To the extent that they do, they may not always have sufficient capacity for redress. 
This makes turning vicious cycles of injustice into virtuous cycles of justice difficult. However, difficult does not mean impossible, and human service professionals have an important role to play in this regard. Fraser also places her hopes for change in what she calls counter-public spheres. She believes that civil society has an important role to play in that alternative debates and practices can be explored, tested and advocated for by civil society organizations and their members. Thompson retorts that it has been shown over and over again that while civil society organizations are able to articulate criticism of particular injustices and of how they are connected, it is much harder and often takes very long to influence decision-making bodies in these matters. Again, this course is intended to address these kinds of challenges and human service practitioners, in our view, are particularly well equipped to address them. Existing debates about Nancy Fraser's conceptualization of social justice show that her model provides a normative framework that is appropriate for human service professions and is helpful in the analysis of contemporary forms of social injustice. However, open questions remain as to how to respond. Besides deepening your understanding of issues and challenges surrounding equity and diversity for human service professionals, one of the main purposes of this course is to explore different ways of responding. Given the limitations of Fraser's work, we will do so by drawing on a range of other theories, approaches and practices offered by both local and international writers on social work and other human services. Nonetheless, careful analysis of prevailing injustices and a clear sense of what a just society might look like are indispensable for social work and other human services that are defined by a professional commitment to social justice. And this is where Nancy Fraser's work has an enormous contribution to make. We will now follow up with a couple of activities to help you explore and deepen your understanding of her concepts.